Okay, welcome to this fourth part of the lecture. And uh, after our small excursion on Hilbert spaces, let's return to Banach spaces. And uh, I want to give you some more examples for integral operators that we'll be using throughout the lecture. Okay, so one of these will be the convolution operator, which I already mentioned. So this is definition 2.6. We usually look at it in the following sense, that f and g in L1 of Rn, and then we define the convolution of f and g in the following way f star g of x for an x in rn is defined as the integral over f of x minus y g of y dy is that set x is in Rn as well. So the convolution is an operator that maps Rn to R. And uh, I uh, state that it's actually, it's well defined. I want, maybe I should have a lemma for that. Um, F star J is well defined and we have that F star J is in L1 of Rn. Uh, let me show the second part. If it's well defined then the one norm would be defined as the integral over Rn, absolute value of integral over Rn, f of x minus y, g of y dy dx, which is smaller than integral Rn, integral Rn, um, absolute value of x of x minus y, absolute value of g of y, dy, dx. And uh, now I change the order of integration and uh, I will mention why I can do that later. So this is integral over n, integral over rn. So instead of dy, dx, I write dx, dy. So that now becomes f of x minus y dx g of y dy and uh, of course the inner one over here is whoops <laughs> um, makes a transformation x minus y to z and then this is nothing but the one norm of f so this is Smaller or equal to the one norm of f, or equal to actually one norm of f times, well, the integral, oh, I forgot the absolute value up here, times, well, integral over n absolute value of g of y dy, so that's norm g, and we have this. Okay, so y uh, is interchanging the integral permitted, well, for this one, oops. This one is absolutely convergent, so I can actually, I can change the order of integration here. Okay, um, and of course, if, if that is limited, then uh, this integral over here must exist. And that also proves that it's well defined for all, most all x in Rn. 
Okay, uh, so we have that. <clears throat> and uh, I mentioned that um, I could now fix G. Oops, that always happens. I can now fix G and uh, view F as a parameter, then the convolution maps from L1 of Rn to L1 of Rn, of course, G in L1, right? And uh, uh, that all this happens too. Okay. And uh, now then we have that the norm of F convolved with G, the one norm is less or equal to the norm of, let me write it this way, norm of G times the norm of F. And since G is fixed, this uh, first one is a constant. And with respect to F, the convolution is continuous. With respect to L1. Um, we also some, show something else for L2 later. I don't need it now. Okay, uh, one thing that's very closely collected to the radon transform, which may be a little bit surprising, is the Hilbert transform. And uh, I'd like to at least introduce it now. Definition 2.7, oh no, 2.8 now. Um, the Hilbert transform, let me assume I won't need anything else than that. So let f in s. So it's a fast decaying uh, function in C infinity. Actually, all we need, I think, is something like C0 um, intersection with L1 or L2. But uh, anyway, um, define the Hilbert transform of a function f at some point x as one over pi the integral over r f of y over x minus y dy. Now, um, that doesn't really make sense, right? I mean, if f is continuous, then uh, this has uh, a pole of order one at x, so you can't integrate over it, but you can integrate over it using the Cauchy principal value, which is defined as uh, the limiting value for epsilon to zero, integral over uh, y, uh, I have y, sorry, absolute value of y larger than uh, 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 x minus, yeah, y minus x larger than epsilon f of y over x minus y dy. And uh, it turns out that uh, this one exists and uh, it has a very nice correlation with the Fourier transform and that's something you will show in the next exercise sheet. And uh, also uh, what follows from its representation with Fourier transform is that uh, the inverse exists. And uh, you can easily show that uh, the in inverse is continuous with respect to L2, I think. That's the easiest thing to show. 
So um, invertible and uh, the inverse is continuous. with respect to the two norm. Um, and that's something you will show in the exercises. Now, um, next thing um, I already mentioned, I just mentioned the Fourier transform. I'm not going to correctly define it here because I will have an extra chapter on the Fourier transform. But um, now let me not even give it a number. I will just mention it as a remark. You should know the Fourier transform from, uh, from the lecture analysis three. And uh, let's take a function f in L1 or L2. I'm not specifying that here. Then the Fourier transform of a function is defined as one over two pi to the minus n over two integral over rn e to the minus i x psi f of x dx. Now this is the definition I will always use. This is different from what the engineers usually use in two ways. First, um, this is my scaling factor, and uh, you will see why I use it in a second. And the second thing that's different is there's a minus sign up here. So uh, usually the mathematical definition of the Fourier transform includes the minus sign. Um, very often in uh, technical applications, there's a plus sign up there. So whenever you look at technical papers, engineering papers, be aware what the sign is because that can be crucial. Okay, the inverse transform, and that's something we'll show, is defined as one over two pi minus n over two e to the i x xi f of xi d xi. And uh, with that definition, we have that f hat tilde is f for f in L2. And um, we'll show everything about this again, and you should know it from analysis three, but often it's not treated in very much detail. So uh, we look at it again. And now you see why I had this strange factor over here, uh, because now it's the same factor uh, for the forward and inverse Fourier transform. And uh, if you define it differently, like none over here, uh, and then if you leave it out in the definition of the Fourier transform, then you get uh, the one over two pi to the n uh, for the inverse transform. The nice thing here is both have exactly the same shape, except, uh, except for the minus sign in the exponent. Okay, um, we have um, the, um, also something you prove is that uh, the norm of f, the two norm of f is the same as the two norm of f hat. Um, and of course, uh, the two norm of f, uh, is, and of course that's the same as the two norm of f tilde, and again, that's uh, due to the factor I introduced. And uh, that means uh, that, oops, with respect to the two norm, and that's, I think that's Plancherel. And um, that means that um, the Fourier transform is continuous. Right, its norm is one. But also the inverse Fourier transform is continuous. It also has a 
mod 1. So, like for um, like for the Hilbert equation, or Hilbert, uh, or, uh, the Hilbert transform, let me say that this is the Hilbert transform. Um, the inverse of the Hilbert transform exists in a certain space and it's continuous, so it's a well posed problem in a way. And um, also here for L2, we have that Fourier transform and inverse Fourier transform are continuous, so uh, and they exist on all of L2. So uh, also this one is well posed with respect to L2. Now, um, one last remark. And um, I'm showing this here because uh, uh, we'll very often be dealing with improperly posed problems that are discontinuous. Um, in fact, many integral operators are continuous, and uh, that's why I'm giving you some examples, some counterexamples here at this point. Uh, you, you always have to be um, very cautious with these things. Okay, uh, so let's take any operator or linear operator from x to y. Let's assume both are Banach spaces and let's assume that this operator is linear. Uh, let's further assume that this operator is continuous, its norm is bounded, and in fact we assume that the norm of this operator, and I'm writing as an operator from x to y, uh, is limited by 1, it's smaller than 1. Um, now then define the operator A as the identity operator minus k, and, uh, well, first of all, you see, of course, the uh, operator norm is limited, so A is continuous. And uh, um, I say that uh, A is invertible, and uh, this can be done in a very, very general setting, but I will do it very concretely here, and uh, if you've been to, for example, my lecture in numerical linear algebra, then you also, then you already know the trick that's coming up now. We use the Neumann series uh, to uh, compute the inverse explicitly. And uh, so to solve AF equals G, so we can task is now to solve AF equals G, so find an F such that F AF is G. Uh, we look at the, we define F as the sum okay, from zero to infinity, K to the K, K to the K, well, it's okay, G. Now the question is, does this exist? Does that series exist? And uh, let me just notice that this is bounded. Sum of, well, let me take it up to some finite M. This is bounded by um, some k to the k, norm k times norm g. And of course, this is bounded by the geometric series. So this is smaller than 1 over 1 minus norm of k. And uh, from this set already, it immediately follows that the um, partial sums are Cauchy sequence
So since this is Banner space, it must converge. So um, that means that F is well defined. Now, okay, now F is well defined. Now look at what, uh, let's look at what the value is. Um, we have that um, AF. Or a uh, AF is um, one minus K times the limiting value of um, K to infinity. Whoops, K to the K times. No, 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 excuse me. Let me write down the definition which I gave. And tending to infinity, sum k equal from zero to n, k to the k times g. And uh, since everything is continuous, we can take the uh, limiting value out. So that's the limiting value of n going to infinity. Now we have something like, oh, um, let me just write it down, i minus k times the sum, k from zero to n, k to the k times g. Now this is nothing. I mean, you're adding, subtracting, adding, subtracting. So this is nothing but g minus k to the n plus one, times g. Now k to the n plus 1 times g converges to 0 since the norm of k is smaller than 1. So this is g. So uh, we found the inverse. So the operator is, um, is um, invertible. Uh, the operator a is invertible. And we have that the norm of a to the minus 1g, which is the norm of f I defined above, is smaller than, well, I already had it here, 1 over 1 minus the norm of k times the norm of g, so a to the minus 1 is continuous. And again, the problem af equals g is a well posed problem. And uh, of course, this is something you definitely know about if you've been to the lecture on functional analysis. Hmm. I've lost my mouse pointer.